Hi, Lisa Louise Cook from the Genealogy Gems podcast back here at Roots Tech 2012. And uh, I know I have listeners all around the world, but I have a feeling that you UK listeners are going to be very interested in who my guest is today. I want to welcome to the show, Nick Barrett. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thank you so much. Well, I heard the rumor that you had uh, somehow Little Bird told you Roots Tech 2012 was happening and you jumped on a plane and came over here. Is that true? It's pretty true, yes. <laughs> 19 hours of travel straight into the 1940 census dinner, although I missed the dinner part of it, which is most unfortunate. Oh gosh, we need to get your food. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, well, I haven't slept since. Yeah. Oh, so wow. excuse me if I appear, appear it wired, but I've just had such a fantastic time. It's inspiring to be here. I, we don't have anything like it in the UK. We've right. got the Who Do You Think You Are live show, right. which is great fun, brings everyone together. 15,000 footfall, great. However, this is cutting edge. This is the future of genealogy. It's great to see the developers mixing with the participants, sharing ideas, having the ideas challenged on stage, some inspirational keynote speeches. Oh, yeah. All of it needs to come back to the UK. It really does. There's so much that we can learn from what's going on here. Well, it's interesting because I went and spoke at uh, Who Do You Think You Are last year for the first time, and I did some technology topics, and they kind of said, hmm, I think we might want to continue with this. So I'm, I'm heading back. I'll be doing several of them, Google Earth being one. And I was just surprised because in many ways, you're so far ahead of us in terms of the television, you know, that's going on and the, the fact that you're getting the masses to really get excited about family history. Why is it that maybe the technology has lagged a little bit behind as far as merging together in family history? It's a really difficult conundrum because Who Do You Think You Are came out at exactly the time when we had a large increase in the number of data sets available. So in many ways, it was always there. But the creativity seems to be driven far more by the states. I mean, don't forget, the major company that came over and started the Internet Revolution in the UK was Ancestry. Yeah. So it's always been in the vanguard of US technology coming across. Bright Solid obviously has now become a major player in the UK and is crossing over to the US sure as well. Is, yeah. They've announced that here at Roots Tech. But I think we like the old-fashioned way. It's a very British thing to do. British bureaucracy, <laughs> pen and paper. <laughs> Quill and parchment. Yes. I think it does take a little bit longer to get up to speed, but that's not to say we're getting there. Uh, there's been a huge debate about the impact of technology and digitization in the UK, right. and it's having a profound impact on the archives themselves. So I think there's this, it's almost a fear that the more you digitize, the more you're going to stop people coming into those archives. Now we're under great funding pressure in the UK at the moment, as indeed are most places, yeah. and the archives are in a very difficult place. They're having to embrace new technology, and open up their collections online, which is great. We all benefit from it. Right. They get some revenue stream. However, as people stop coming in person, their footfall decreases, and the funders are going, well, look, why do you need to search for them anymore? <laughs> so it's a catch-22. That's why I think there might be a little bit of ambivalence towards really going for the new technology. But there are groups that are trying. I represent FreeBMD, which is a transcription project. Right. We put as many records on, as possible online. We've got an army of transcribers around the world double keying it so it's pretty accurate stuff and we believe that the technology has to lead the way so we want to set up a charity and have a whole series of open source transcription tools oh, a whole series of apps that can be developed this is why i'm so keen to meet people here because well, they want to is, feed into the it. archives continues to be the preservation hub they become you know they are the the one source but in a way for something like free bmd is more suited for the distribution I, I know we all, all heard an archivist, you know, sit around and go, oh gosh, there's more people coming in the door, and now it's a little worrisome, but um, I would think that the partnership seems natural. I think it's a partnership that needs to be on the right level. Yeah. So we need to find a balance between acknowledging the existence of the commercials and the money they bring to the sector. That's, that is fundamental. We need that money. We need their technology and expertise. Yes. We also need to recognize the volunteer elements who can produce some fantastic transcription data, but also the need for the archives to keep people coming in. There is a happy medium somewhere in the middle whereby we can have a paywall perhaps in place at the point of viewing the images, pay-per-view almost, but the transcriptions and indexes are free to attract people in. That benefits both the archives and, of course, the commercial entities. Mm -hmm. And then they can start to develop new tools to attract people to their subscription models. So you can manipulate the data, add in third-party content, for example, do some yes. really creative stuff with audio and vi video. Personal archiving is the way I think it should be going. And that then frees up the archives to do their digitization work and become experiential sensors. You go to an archive, not because you want to find a parish register, but because you found it already. You want to find what life was like, and you want the interpretation and the skills of the archivist. The context, I mean, exactly, yes. the relevance to make it personal yeah. to you. That's what they're there to do. 
And that's really the branch house, is those archivists, the historians walking around those halls who know their stories. Now, I have to say on a totally different subject, um, I've been seeing you on YouTube. You seem to be a bit of a, a just kind of off on your own doing some things. Tell us about what you've been doing on YouTube. Really? That's news to me. I mean, we stream our vodcast on YouTube. I've had the great fortune to interview some wonderful historians, Dan Cruikshank, Jonathan Foyle. I also interviewed the last survivor on the Titanic when I was writing the book Lost Voices. Sadly, she passed away a few months after the interview, but we've managed to get a lot of content there, and obviously for 2012 being the centenary, that's going to be quite relevant. Are you going to be involved in some of those activities? I am, yes. Yeah. I've got a few talks and tours lined up in okay. April, some in the UK, some in Ireland. It's, it's, it's one of those interesting moments where, as with the First World War and the last survivors disappear, it stops being living and relevant. It suddenly becomes a piece of history. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, it's very interesting with a lot of stuff that's going on in Europe. We've had this big maritime disaster in Italy. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's a terrible tragedy. No, I know, but... But these things still come around. It's almost it's a, uncanny. But it it is. when it did, and then it's... 100 years. There's a perennial fascination with the sea and with survivor stories, and who should we blame? It, it's at the heart of the whole mystery behind the Titanic. And some of the responses. People, I heard a lot of people talking on television comparing the responses of people in today's disaster with the way they handled it, as in women and children first, that type of thing. I mean, and it's, it's really uh, representative of our culture. And you can only learn that by comparing the past, can't you? You need those examples. Yeah. You need those human stories. Because that way you can empathize and say, how would I react in that circumstance? That's, I think, the crucible of how these events become perennially interesting. And the further back they go, the less relevant they become to us almost. They just become another story to tell and, oh, and there's nothing more we can find out about the Titanic. Well, I think there is. I think there's an awful lot we can still learn from these big events from the early part of the 20th century. They still echo through the ages. There and is this fascination. It's certainly an event that we share, as in the US and the UK, yes. you know, on both sides. It was great doing the research, looking at the comparison between the boards of inquiry. The one in the US was really quite vitriolic. Quite rightly so, given the number of people that died. Sure. The British one was a lot more of a cover-up. It was almost like, oh, well, the Americans have done their job. We'll just yeah. uh, tie up the last bits and change our code of conduct. It was amazing looking at the two different... Oh, so uh, history is all about, again, the perspective absolutely. that you're coming from. And as you read it, you're like, oh, okay, you, have to, you really do have to know yes. the context of that person to yes. understand their interpretation. Do you find that... Um, well, first of all, tell us the name of the book and how people can get it, because this is going to become more and more of a topic, and they're going to want to learn more about it. Well, the book is called Lost Voices from the Titanic, okay. and there's well, there's a U.S. version that we printed, Palgrave Macmillan, okay. they're publishing cool. that. Uh, you should be able to get that through their website or through Amazon. And it's really a collection of some of the survivor stories that have been locked away in archives. Now, some of it's been used by historians but it's been sanitized, it's been used to illustrate a point or try and work out what happened. What I've tried to do is add the narrative, but let the voices speak for themselves, and that gives you a much greater sense of the confusion that occurs. So if you look at the survivor stories from one side of the boat, it seems to be quite orderly and everything's quite sanitized, and we went to the lifeboats and got on and we got away. You come to the other side and no one quite knows what's happening when, and there's this confusion, and that gets you to the heart of it. It was a very difficult book to research, because you did feel like you were transported back to the deck. You do get that, how would I react kind of moment. So there's some, there's some great moments, but there's some very difficult moments to read as well. Absolutely. Well, tell us what 2012 and beyond is going to bring for Nick Barrett. Where are we going to see you? Well, I, I have to believe you are going to be many places. <laughs> <laughs> well, no sleep by the sound of yeah, it. I yeah. can quite, quite happily cope with that for a few more days. But uh, when I get home... We have the run-up to Who Do You Think You Are Live, mm -hmm. which will take place last weekend in February. I'm doing a show before that on house history, oh, so I don't great. get any free weekends. That's becoming very popular in the UK, isn't it? It is, yes. We've hopefully yeah. got a few TV shows lined up to do. I say oh, we, goodness. as in there's a couple of broadcasters looking at it. It's another flip side of genealogy. Who are you? Well, where did you live? It's, it's a logical thing, really, mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing that. Um, I hope to get out to New Zealand in June to speak at a conference there. Wonderful. And I'd love to get back in the fall to the US. I've just fallen in love with this particular event and it struck yeah. me that I haven't been out here as much as perhaps I could or should have done but there'll be the finishing of the London book which should be out in time for the Olympics uh, more of the vodcasts I'm at the moment teaching a course for a university on house history so I want to expand that a little bit yeah it's, it's a it's a busy year it's a busy yeah. year and, and finally I am interested about the house history 
obviously you have much older architecture than we do in many respects. Although when I renovated a Victorian years ago, that was one of the first things I did. I headed down to the library and found in the unidentified picture file a photograph of the house. And they were thrilled to have it identified. But for, for you in the UK, there's so much more extensive research. What is driving that interest right now, that focus on our residences? Is it just because what you think you are has been generating our own interest in our own past? Hmm, what about the places we live? I think you'll, you'll spot some with that. It's, it's moved from being genealogy of family history into a much broader spectrum. I call it personal heritage because you're That's trying to point. contextualize who you're related to with where they lived not just the house but the community so there's an element of social house history there right. but also what jobs did they do so it's a really nice package you can't do one in isolation so local social house and family history fused into this much greater understanding that's going into mainstream education in a whole series of education packages that often support the curriculum and have got the kids infused so oh, they yeah. want to find out about their community they walk down the street and they go well who built that <laughs> when was that constructed and, they then talk to the older members of the community, so it's a really nice sort of cross-generational package. And different families, several different families could share that one common thread, which is we Absolutely. all at some point shared this home. And we all use the same data sets, 1911 yeah. census, indexed by not just the name of the person who lived there, but the house number. You can go back and find out who lived in your house, or where your ancestors lived, is it still standing? Interlay that with map data, have a look at some of the photographs that exist. Yes. It's a great resource, and the great thing is houses don't move. People yeah. disappear <laughs> and go true. all around the world. Houses they put, or at least Absolutely. they meant to anyway. So are you jealous that we're getting the 1940 census? Yes, mm -hmm. usually. Particularly because we don't have a census in 1941 in the UK. Oh, it was never okay. held because of the Second World War. Right, right. And the 31 census was destroyed. So we've only got one major data set between here and 1951. Wow. So there'll be a big gap. So it's a fantastic project. So I'll be taking the message back home to the UK go to the 1940 website, try and get involved as a transcriber. It really oh, is an amazing it. resource. So for me, it's not just great because it provides her historical data, but also it's a great example of collaboration between a commercial entity, archives, mm -hmm. and of course, family search. It's crowdsourcing, which is something that FreeBMD are very keen to promote as well. Yeah. So hopefully that model will catch on back home as well. Wonderful. Well, you know, family history, technology, it, it, it's all about the connection and the people. Thrilled to have you here. I'm going to let you go eat and then do your thing, and you're going to get to sleep tonight, right? I Before hope so. Before you fly out. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you.